I've given everyone a heads up. Um, okay, and it looks like we are recording. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's Tuesday evening, March 9th, and we're back at it with you for the fourth time talking about hybrid reopening, reinventing schools yet again. Uh, yeah. And Ms. Jenkins and I are excited to give you, uh, I think the objective for tonight I'll frame as two parts, um, an update on how things are going now that we are six days of in-person instruction in, right? Um, two days of which with all grades K through eight, we're really excited to be sharing with you some of the great things that are happening and some of the things that we're still chipping away at and, and finding ways to tweak and enhance and improve. And then the second part of tonight, which is a little more brief for now, uh, but we can take questions, which may open it up near the end, is to looking forward to fourth quarter and what questions parents may have. So we know that some of you that are joining us tonight are parents of hybrid students who are wondering what your babies are up to all day when they're here from nine to four, right? Um, and I'm sure they're coming home telling you stories and you'll want to hear our stories too, right? Um, and then some of you are wondering, okay, so what's it going to be like if my remote learning child is going to come back next quarter? I'm still weighing that decision, right? And we've had a lot of uh, lessons learned along the way, Ms. Jenkins and I and the staff, and we're excited to share with you and then take your questions at the end as we have in the prior sessions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ms. Jenkins, you ready for me to share my screen? Ah, uh, yes. Ready. Okay. So I will start presenting and then Ms. Jenkins, whenever you'd like to start, go for it. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as Mr. Graves said, it's good to have you. We're happy to be able to update you um, as we told you we would, because uh, while we talked about it, obviously, once you get started in the situation, it's going to be some updates, um, but actually not as many as we anticipated. So hopefully you get a just a, a general understanding of how things are going here at LaSalle with hybrid learning. So um, next slide. All right, hold on. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so basically, uh, the three areas I just want to talk about are just your choice as a family choice. Um, the, how are the logistics and safety going um, these, this week, second weekend? And then uh, it's part time for you to kind of ask some questions about now. And I'm sure some questions about fourth quarter as well. Next. So as you know, uh, families were given the choice, right, of remote learning or um, in-person learning in a hybrid situation. And honestly, there's no perfect right way to choose for a district like CPS with so many families involved. So I myself am happy with the choice that you're able to, I hope it brings you some comfort having that choice that, that is best for you out of the two only choices we really could make. Uh, we're very happy to see your children back in the building and we completely understand if you've made the choice to remain at home and we're still happy to see their little faces over the screen. Next. So if your student uh, is remaining at home, then just know that our at-home learning is as important to us as our in-school hybrid learning. So we want to make sure that students at home have that same rich learning experience that students in the building have. There'll be some differences because there are obviously building logistics that have to happen like uh, restroom breaks and, and uh, community building within the classroom itself. We want to make sure that students at home have the access to the learning in the same way um, as the students in the building. Still, we want to maintain peer interaction, student to student discussion, and um, as it makes sense logistically, students at home being able to interact with students in the building. And CPS did send us equipment uh, to help make that possible uh, with speakers and, and headphones. And so we're hoping that you know, as we get off to the start, we've been seeing it in action in a, in a very um, interesting way. So we have speakers where the students in the building can hear the students at home and have those conversations, hear their responses, share their responses. So it's, it's coming along, I think, in a very positive way. And then same for hybrid learning. So if students are here for hybrid, they're here two days a week, except for I think one pod. They're here two days a week. Again, similar schedule with the in-person logistics taken into consideration. Uh, same access to the teacher peer interaction is a little uh, more richer in school, obviously, because students have students have another student sitting next to them and they can, you know, lean over and talk to their. I'm sorry, I'm on mute. Chris, can you mute? Thank you. Um, 
they can lean over and talk to their neighbor in a, in a more probably authentic feeling way to a student. But outside of that, obviously, the fact that someone's sitting next to them, I think they still get to interact and see their friends on the screen as well. So they're not just cut out of one another's lives. So the grouping plans are different depending on the time of day. Sometimes the teacher is teaching everyone um, together. Sometimes the teacher has separated the groups into at-home versus um, in school. And sometimes even in school, they're separated into grouping there as well. So. So a couple of things I want to go through, and this we'll do in picture form, <laughs> some entry and exit, building logistics, and then uh, community building goes with building logistics, and then world language essentials and recess kind of let you know how it's going. So we'll go through the pictures and we'll discuss um, how things are looking next. So the entry and exit procedures were our biggest, I think, foci. We're, we wanted to make sure that students were entering the building in a timely manner, knowing that students at home are awaiting their uh, peers to join them. So next slide. So we do, first of all, thank you um, to parents for donating the uh, welcome back signs. We have two, one in the front and one in the back. But what you'll see as you arrive are, are, are adults at each entry door. There are staggered entries, fifth grade and sixth grade seven and eight each come in uh, separate doors, but at uh, 10 minutes early, they come at 8.50, then you'll see third and fourth uh, coming in at nine o'clock, and then second and under coming in at 9.10 with different um, assistance, uh, classroom assistance and staff support uh, at each doorway, testing uh, temperatures, checking to make sure that everyone has filled out health screeners. Parents have been really amazing about completing health screeners on time. Next slide so that when children arrive, we can then very quickly go through our list, check them in, get them in the building. Next slide. And next one. Very good. And as you see, we tried um, to really give good social distancing cues. We use the gate, that's the easiest one. Seventh and eighth grade use the gym, they have squares built up to the floor of the gym and then X is on the ground for first grade and second grade. So we feel very sure that we've, we've created a system in which people can arrive safely. And thank you, of course, to the um, parents of second and under for staying with your students in those morning times. So that really allowed us, that's a strong part of our system because in order for us to get the students in, we can only be at so many entries at the same time. So parents of second grade and under stay with their students until we can get them in the building. And that makes a difference uh, to, to our success and be able to get everyone third grade and above in the building and then move on to second and below. So thank you to you. Thank you to our classroom assistants, our SICAs, um, our, our cadre and miscellaneous employees for helping support that. It's been really, I think, an amazing experience and I'm very grateful for all of that support. We could not do it without each of those parts being in place. Next slide. So let's look at some building logistics. You're gonna see students in front of a computer, students not in front of a computer, a combination of a computer, but they're looking at the teacher who's teaching in front. They're looking at their peers on the screen. They may be looking at a teacher on the screen, but there's an adult, um, a cadre in the, in the building walking around helping them as they're in the building, in their rooms, if their teacher is teaching remotely. So many different styles when you go into each different classroom as we visit rooms. What's good to see is when I talk to students, they're happy to be back in the building and we're happy to have them back in the building. And while they're still learning, I think just even a change of pace is emotionally uh, been great for most of our students. Next one. Uh, thank you to the parents uh, who helped students make signs for us. And we saw um, chalkboard welcome signs and thank you signs. So thank you. Um, and I love that one. Can't mask gratitude because that uh, kind of brings me back to the safety protocols of how wonderful the students have been about wearing their mask, about following the social distance. Yes, it requires a lot of reminders, but I think that that's to be expected. But honestly, the mask has students have been doing a remarkable job and it hasn't been um, really an issue. We have backup masks but that um, here, but we're also passing out next week, we're passing out uh, our CPS mask free. They don't say CPS, it's just a blue mask. Students will get three of them in their backpacks starting uh, shift A of next week and then shift B of next week. So we'll send you an email about it, but look for those masks so you get three additional masks and we always have a backup mask if there's an issue and that's probably happened three times, like it's not been an issue at all. Go on. 
Thank you. Just more examples, same thing of students, different learning styles. Cool. One more. All right, so here you see a picture of Coach H. Um, so essentials are in the classroom. Uh, they'll be outside and inside, not at the weather. I mean, we got lucky weather-wise. Now that the weather is broken, we'll be seeing gym outside a lot of times, uh, but also if you see it in the gym following still uh, safety protocols um, in the classroom, we may move it into the gym. Now it looks like our new guidance coming in uh, allows us a little more space. So we might see gym move to the gym, but there's still only so much movement they can do inside. So you'll see it outside most of the time. Uh, library is also in the classroom and art is in the classroom as well. And our the students don't travel, the teachers travel. So the gym teacher comes to the room or the art teacher comes to the room. And, and, and Jenkins, I think, I think we've said this before. Can I just chime in really quickly? Mm -hmm. um, like it, the, the normal protocol in all schools, right, is the teacher travels because there's less likelihood of transfer of virus, right? There are some exceptions that we're still trying to, and you'll hear us talk about some things that now that we have these first six days in place, especially two days with the bigger kids, which is why we mm -hmm. wanted to check in now and tell you where we're at now and some things we're trying. So we're gonna try to take an essentials class to another space, like take gym outside or take library to the library or to an open classroom to like get them in a different space. The, pro the big challenge as you can imagine, like why would we not do that more often is you have to then sanitize that space in between each use because now another group of students would go to that space. So we're, we're trying to start with the foundation in place and then see if we can tweak it in some way. But as you can see in this picture, I mean, the kindergartners are still having fun with gym class in their classroom, and now we can try to find ways to do that differently in the future. Yeah, other issues, I mean, there's so many things to, to really take in consideration. There's movement in the hallway to consider. When is the next class coming to consider? Because if this class is in, we're, we're in the gym, the next class can't be in the gym. So there's lots of things to consider. Um, actually, for gym, that's almost an easier fix because they can be outside. But um, it'll be art and library where we try to work. We'll try to work that schedule as best we can to get the movement. But so far, students have been really great about it. And, and it's been working. But if, certainly, we all want them to, if nothing else, just go to a different space. So if I can get them in the cafe and use that for an art class, that would be, that would be a, the way we would like, the direction we'd like to take it in. Next Thank you. Uh, there's that, that was the first day, I think, of school there. We were just kind of walking in, saying hi to kids, checking on them as they got set up. Um, again, the little ones have, um, and little being K-2, kindergarten has iPads. Uh, first and second have their laptops, and they don't bring theirs back and forth to school. We really thought through what makes sense logistically. Do we have enough devices for students to, to each have them? No, but what makes sense for our school? So we wanted to put something in place where the little ones did not have to bring their computers back and forth to school every day. Um, and we were able to do that, thank goodness, with new computers delivered from CPS. And so we're happy with that situation. And if we are to get, if we get more computers, we'll move that up um, to third grade even and, and fourth if we can. But for now, I think at least K2 solidly can keep a device here at school instead of bringing it back and forth. And so far, we haven't had any major issues with the, with the older students not being able to, to make that uh, change of bringing it back and forth. Here you have a picture. We ordered additional PPE, which were little lunch um, pods. I don't know what you want to call them, little lunch uh, brackets for students so they can still take their mask off and, and, and feel relatively safe as they're eating their lunch. And we had enough for the first shift and now um, every student has enough, every classroom has enough for each student to be able to sit behind their little lunch pods as they eat with their mask off. Cause they're not just eating, they're eating and chatting and you know, it's the relaxing time for them. And so, so far it's gone, I think, well having that additional PPE in place for them. Teachers are not um, with students for lunch. We have um, cadre with students, miscellaneous employees, seekers and classroom assistants. They're really supporting us during the lunch times as well. And then as you see, we have these dots on the floor. Students stand on the dot when they're in the hallway. So at every point when students aren't actually walking, they should be standing on the dot. And um, it requires some reminding, but I would say that also students have adapted to that very quickly. As you know, children are very, very um, adaptable anyway. So they've adapted that habit very quickly, even the kindergartners. They're, they're 
quick to jump to their next little dot. And then, um, you know, so that I think is successful. The only place where we probably aren't as successful is when we line right in the classroom, just kind of reminding students to try to judge their distance by their eyeballs. That's the only place that I think we're still working on to get students in the habit of is being able to judge a good distance without something like a dot there as a reminder. Next. And uh, students go outside for recess, um, but there'll be inclement weather where they'll be in the classroom for lunch and recess. Um, but so we've been very lucky weather-wise, but um, you just kind of get a glimpse. So students are able to play in a designated area. They're gonna rotate through on the turf. So if students didn't have turf this week, they'll get turf play area next week. Some students may be, on, if they were in the turf this week, they might be on the asphalt next week, but they get a chance to run around and play with their friends outside of recess. Next. All right, so um, we'll talk about fourth quarter and then we'll move into a QA and a where you can ask if you have more questions about what's going on here logistically for third quarter and then we'll talk about um, what's going on for fourth quarter. Mr. Rose. Yeah, so we've been looking at some of the questions that came through and sorry, I think the, the link might have been wrong at first. So we know that many of you will ask questions and I think the chat box is open. So if you want to put chat questions in, in text form or just send them privately to us. You can do that as well. Oops, I didn't mean to go forward. Um, sorry. Um, here we go. Uh, yep. So we, we looked at some of those questions. We wanted to just kind of be transparent and, and come ahead of them here. So I'm going to answer as much as I can right now and then whatever questions remain, we'll get to those. So one of the biggest questions that has come up either privately by, by email or in the survey is what about staffing fourth quarter? Um, citywide, I think I read that there are, like I don't have hard numbers on this in any internal systems, I'm, we're not privy to that, but there's about 33% of teachers across the city that receive some type of work at home accommodations. And as a school, we're below that. So, um, you know, nothing outrageous happening here, but you know, the reality is staff have a variety of needs. And yes, staff are being offered vaccinations. As you hear in the news, staff are being offered or asked about their vaccination status. But when you think about a few layers deeper than that, we know that many staff may have not only their own health factors, but family members, right? I'm, I'm fully vaccinated at this point, my wife is not. So if I am carrying some type of respiratory illness, even if I'm safe from it, I might give it to my wife, right? Now I am at work, but uh, others may be looking into accommodations in the future all across the city. So it's all still kind of uncertain, um, regardless of what you may hear in the news, we know that there is still some uncertainty for fourth quarter. So CPS will be revisiting that in the coming weeks. Um, our commitment to you is to be more proactive than we were last quarter. Last quarter was such a moving target. It was the first time we had ever done anything like this, like staff getting accommodations to work at home. It was a rolling process that started in December and went through February. So I apologize if any of our communication impacted family arrangements like childcare or transportation, pod, like shifting from pod A to pod B. We tried to be uh, responsive, but then we'd have things like two kids in one pod and we decided to shut down that pod because you probably weren't interested in sending your child back to school to be in a pod of two kids. So if we condense those kids into the other pod, like all of these things we had no way of anticipating what was going to happen ended up playing out and we had to be responsive and try to be communicative. So I think we nailed 99% of it in some form, either not necessarily perfectly, and there's 1% of that margin of error that we just, you know, might not have tightened up on a spreadsheet or something like that. And we're trying to get even better. So our commitment is hopefully by spring break, which gives three weeks or two weeks of school before fourth quarter would, so three weeks really planning wise to have that decision for you, if we know it, if, uh, teacher is going to be coming back next quarter or not if they're currently at home. So yes, you can make the assumption that all teachers are, are coming back across the city, but clearly there are going to be myriad factors that CPS considers with everyone. I also want to be clear, CPS makes that decision, right? Staff apply, just like when a teacher goes out on maternity or paternity leave. Staff inform us, but CPS ultimately makes those decisions. 
Um, we also know when we're looking ahead to fourth quarter, many families are going to change to hybrid. We know. I've already heard from a number of families, when can I opt in? When can I opt in? So we know right now we are at 44% in person. Actually, on paper, it says 44%. We know in, in every classroom or every other classroom has been a couple of kids who just haven't shown up and the family says, oh, we're still waiting it out. We're still deciding or we failed the health screener because we traveled recently. So on paper, it's 44%. It probably feels more like 38, 40%. Um, and you can see that there was an article recently of all the schools across the city and where the higher and lower percentages are. Um, but, you know, we're gonna, um, we're gonna see an uptick in the next couple of weeks when you're filling out the surveys and, and we're excited for that because we we're hoping that our presentation tonight gives you a sense of calm if you are the kind of family that was wondering, um, is it safe for my child to get back, come back to school, right? Now, that's a decision you make, but in my opinion, things are going as well as anticipated, as well as the guidance said, as well as all the research by the CDC, everything that, that says this is what it means to be safe during COVID, all of those things are happening in our school. Um, some families asked about four-day pods. So we, we're we trying an experiment in some areas as to whether what four-day podding looks like. The challenge is it's, it's with more, oh, sorry about that, um, with, uh, there we go, with uh, more families opting in next quarter, it's probably going to be less likely to have four-day pods just because once we get to 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 students in a class, uh, the, the basic number is once you pass 15, it's, it's almost impossible because of the size of classrooms and the distance we need. There's a little bit of flexibility based on the size. Um, you will have more flexibility in pod choice next quarter. Right now, as you, as you may know, um, we had um, some pods we just shut down because there were only like one or two kids. So we put them in the other pod or shift. But because there will be more kids coming back next quarter, you're, you're going to have more flexibility as to which pod you choose for your own um, scheduling needs. Um, and we'll talk about before and after school care in a minute too. But th there's still one weird logistic thing that we are uh, trying to figure out. So I'm going to ask for some of you on this call to help us. Um, CPS sent a survey to many of you. I think what happened is they sent it only to families that are currently remote. Because if you are currently hybrid, whether your child is attending in person or not, CPS is making the assumption that you want to continue to learn in hybrid. You're not thinking, well, fourth quarter, you know what, we're just going to stay home. Of course, you can always make that decision, but their assumption is it, it, you're, you're satisfied with how it's going because your child is still hybrid, so you would assumedly stay a hybrid fourth quarter. So what I'm going to ask is if some families can help us privately chat me so I can follow up with you and see what's happening. If you fall in a very specific situation right now, you, you are listed as remote in Aspen. You, the last thing you told us is your, your family has been remote, right? It's official, you officially locked in a decision as remote. You got a message from CPS asking what your decision is for fourth quarter, and you already responded to that and said that you want your child to come back for hybrid instruction. If you fall into that specific category, remote, you got the message from CPS, you opted in for hybrid. If you're willing to, please send me a private chat right now or an email, because we're trying to figure out if that, ha if that is automatically being updated in our Aspen system, or if we need to capture that information in another way, because we're not sure where it's gonna populate and we don't wanna wait until after this two week period of time is over. We wanna make sure that we've heard from every single one of our families as we did back in December, as to whether or not you're planning on coming back. If you say no, we respect that, but it, I'm already seeing some chats come through, which is great, thank you. Um, but if you, we wanna make sure that, that we've at least made contact with you, and if you have any questions, we can answer them so that um, no stone is unturned, so to speak, right? Um, we'll get to questions in a second. One more slide here. Um, as I said multiple times already, week one is done. We're always striving to improve. And I say that very importantly because if your child is coming home and saying, well, I liked this, but I didn't like that. I wish we could do more of this. If it's things that are beyond the rules, you know, I wish my teacher were in person, but at least I get to come in the building. Okay, well then fourth quarter, hopefully, you know, that, that may change. Um, if, you're, if your child comes home saying, I wish we had balls to play with at recess. Okay. My point is, please have your child themselves reach out to me, or you reach out to me and say, hey, just want to give some feedback. Here's what my child is saying. You can always shoot me an email. You know I'm responsive via email. 
because we want to make sure that what we have in place, we were so focused on making this the best first day experience, safety, uh, logistics, what does simultaneous instruction look like, that we know that, I always say, we've answered a million questions and there's always going to be more. So if part of that is like having fun at recess or things like that, please let us know what your child is saying, what you as a family are saying, and we'll see if it's something that we can improve on. So that's why we say feedback from students is helpful. Um, no need to opt in again if you are currently hybrid, unless you hear otherwise from me. So if you see a survey come out from me that says, um, please let us know your decisions for fourth quarter, I'm probably only gonna even send that survey to the current remote families just to stay hyper-focused on that. Um, and then, you know, with the, as it says here, will, uh, willing to discuss ways to overcome the challenges to childcare. This is an interesting one because we have, um, our day goes from nine to four, right? Or 850 to 350, whatever. Um, but we don't really have a strong mechanism. And I hope, I hope you're paying attention if you're interested in childcare before or after school. We don't, the guidance is so strict. Imagine if you have a first grader and you want your child to come at 7 a.m. and stay till 6 p.m. like we used to do with right at school because you have work obligations. I understand and respect that and we want to help. The challenge is your first grader cannot be in a group for child care with anybody from another pod. So the first grader in the classroom next door, the second grader two doors down, the fourth grader upstairs, they can't be within 30 feet of one another is the distance we're supposed to give between pods. So it becomes very financially um, unsustainable to do that. Um, but we are looking for solutions. So my offer as a collaborative, open-minded, um, creative thinker is if you're interested in that and you're willing to partner with me to think through some of these logistical challenges, send me an email or send me a chat and say, I'd like to talk about childcare, but only if I'm sorry to say it this way, but only if you're willing to engage and have that discussion with me. I don't have answers because it's part of it is from the principal and, and assistant principal logistic lens. Part of it is your family's needs. And when we can sit down together over a Zoom and talk through that, we might come up with something that we could put in place in a few weeks. Um, it's just a challenge. I do know, I, I've been told that Menominee is up in operation. Menominee Club right around the corner from here. So um, and I've seen some transportation services like Precious Parcels have been coming and dropping off and picking up. So this is all so new to us, but I do commit to trying to work through with families because we know the world does not operate on nine to four. And we are asking you to drop your kid off at the right time and pick them up at the right time. So trying to help. And beyond that, the last thing I'll say is we're, we don't have many updates on fourth quarter yet. We told you what we told you. We'll answer as many questions as we can, but some of the answers to your questions tonight might be, we're gonna to have to get back to you on that. We get emails from our district leadership like every two days, we're getting devices for teachers in the next couple of days. Like all of this is so new, so we're here to help. But I apologize if we don't have all the answers, we still have what, like six or so weeks until fourth quarter starts. And I anticipate the leadership downtown is, is constantly trying to get us answers for that. So Ms. Jenkins, anything else? Or are we ready to move on to Q&A? Um, ready, real quick before we move on, um, CPS, I did see is hosting an elementary school uh, reopening town hall on the 16th uh, from 5 to 6.30 p.m. So you should be getting some communication from them uh, regarding that. Um, so definitely check that out if you want more details from where they are. Um, but we're going to start with Q&A. Um, and I got a, a direct message, which I think is going to be a public one, just asking. We mentioned that right now we're... 44%, 40 to 44% of students are safely in the building and a parent asks a very valid question, can you accommodate more than 40% safely? That's a great question. And I'll tell you, we didn't, we planned for more than 40%. Um, so what we planned for, uh, well, really all of them, but we knew <laughs> when we did the original planning, it was, we didn't expect 100% to come back. But the planning in place with the two different shifts is to accommodate everyone coming back. So I, my answer is yes, I, I do believe that it's safe. Um, is it possible for a classroom to project the teacher's lectures for those who are in the classroom? Um, that's a great question. Um, can we, so some, the teacher's showing things on their screen, but the students are looking at it on the small screen. So a parent is asking, can we, um, is it possible to have the teacher project that? And so I'll say, uh, Yes, in a lot of cases there are. There's going to be some training we have um, to kind of help teachers 
um, learn how to get that up on the larger screen just because you think of, so the only reason I, I hesitate to give just a firm yes, everyone can do it is because remember, it's different things going on in the uh, classroom. So it might be a group over here doing something different. So we don't want to project that on the screen unless the, it's whole group um, learning going on at that same time. But I do definitely think we can look into ways to project on screen during whole group times if that uh, doesn't hinder uh, grouping plans for the teacher. Thank you. Great question. I think, can I also add to that, like Ms. Jenkins and I have been around to every single classroom multiple times, peeking through the window, popping into the classroom, staying only a couple minutes for six <laughs> reasons, right? Yeah, like we're not trying to like, <laughs> right? Um, but it's interesting because as I've said earlier, I, I wrote an article about this on Medium that like we are all first years at all of this, right? First year teachers, first year administrators, right? We're all yet again for the third time now reinventing everything we do. And I'm, I'm impressed at what our teachers are doing. The interesting thing is we're only six days into for those that are teaching in person and for those teaching at home trying something new because now all their kids are not at their own homes or at a pod like some like we had some today some kids in person who were having technology issues that the kids at home were not having right so like all of this is so new we're seeing a variety of models of instruction right as ms jenkins has said we have teachers who are doing what is called simultaneous teaching where they're at the front of their classroom with the camera pointing at them and they're teaching their in-person kids. I actually modeled this myself for our staff right before kids came back to see, could I do this? What does this look like? I've been out of the classroom for a while, but I tried it and I thought, this is not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Interesting, I can engage with kids in person. It was, Ms. Jenkins was my class in person and, and people on my computer screen. I've seen some teachers where they're still in person with headphones on, looking at all the students on the computer screen, whether they're in person or on the computer. My point is, we're all, everyone is trying different things to see what works best for my teaching style, what works best for my classroom. So um, broadcasting something on the screen, on the projection screen, so that all the kids can see it has its benefits, right? Because now I don't need to have my eyeballs glued to my computer, but it's also not always the best quality I've seen. So sometimes it's better to see it. So sometimes they have both going. I've seen some teachers do and the, the student can choose. Well, I'd rather look at it up here or I'd actually rather look at it on the high resolution screen. But I do encourage you, A1, let's give patience and respect to the teachers who are just trying to figure this out for the first time. We were trained on all this, but I, I myself was afraid to do a simultaneous anything with in-person and at home. And after five minutes of doing it with our staff, I realized, oh, I can do this. So we're, 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 we're tinkering with and we're trying, but you know, feel free to send me a suggestion of like what your child is saying, like I've said, and we can talk with the teachers and see you know, if a one-time lesson, how does that go? And there might be benefits and, and faults to that or reach out to the teacher directly or have your child suggest it. So we are very open-minded to trying different things. But at the end of the day, Ms. Jenkins and I are gonna respect what teaching style fits best with the teacher because the more logistics, the more um, technology needs, things like that, it might actually slow down and, and throw off the instruction the teachers are trying to, to present. So. I've been taking pictures at questions that came to me privately, so I will get back to everyone who messaged me already. But Ms. Jenkins, did you have more questions come through you wanted to address? Um, just one more, and then we'll start taking hands raised if there are any, um, which was, I think we responded to this, but is there a chance that kids will be able to attend four days a week um, in quarter four? And so uh, it's different parts um, to that answer. Students could attend four days a week only under certain circumstances, right? that would have to be met. It's probably less likely that a student would be here four days a week in quarter four because there will be more students. And so we'd have to accommodate students safely. We'd probably have to stick pretty strictly to the separate pods. So I would say um, off the top that it's less chance of students being here uh, four days a week. I think we're gonna still see the same hybrid model with a shift A and a shift B. Um. I'll Can say, you see your hands? I can't see those. Uh, I, I'll look in a second. I did get a bunch of people who said, yeah, we were um, remote and we decided to opt in. So thank you. I'll, I, I took pictures of those names. I do see some people that said um, uh, daycare exemptions, um, uh, people asking about daycare exemptions for teachers. That's something that, I mean, just to be clear, what happens is a teacher applies we don't see the entire paperwork. Like we don't see any of it. It's their confidential business. 
and then it goes to CPS. CPS asks us about our staffing and things like that. We, we let them know what our like scheduling and everything looks like and then they make a decision. Um, it sounds like a logistical nightmare on CPS's end. So I can't, I honestly don't know what types of childcare exemptions are being approved. I can imagine some that are partially medical, like what if, um, you know, the teacher comes to school and then brings something home and then the child goes to daycare and, and um, what if the daycare is, uh, is considering kicking the child out because of um, uh, a, a exposure to COVID? Like, I'm not sure on some of those situations, but I, I will say there's a possibility that staff across the city are getting accommodations for childcare, but it's not as simple as a yes or no, right? It's more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> Deanna. <laughs> What can you project on how the model will look like in fall of 2021? Ooh, you're pushing us now. Um, honestly, it's going to always obviously depend on what's going on with the CDC, uh, Chicago Health Department, uh, the vaccinations. I, I, I'm not in a position to make a projection, but Mr. Graves, do you want to go ahead and make a, I'll, I'll make uh, a prediction? I'll make a prediction. Just And I, I think... And I say that I'll preface this with, we've all made what, how many predictions in the past year and we've all always been wrong, right? I mean, it's, uh, ex with the exception of those of you in the medical industry or something like that, you've made, made some very good predictions. I've thought about, I, I remember when we were writing our CIWP, our school strategic plan back in January, February, March, April, May, June, you can think of how things evolved and it just, um, uh, we thought we were all coming back in the fall. And then of course, everything got worse and worse. And then we all started remote. Um, Originally, we thought we were coming back in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My prediction is there will be fully in-person or fully remote, no hybrid instruction. That's what I think New York is shifting to in the near future, or, or they just did. I just, I haven't read the full article. We've been so busy here, but um, that's my prediction. Unless COVID continuously spikes, I think it'll be safe enough that all students will be welcome back. We'd have five days a week up to 28 or so students in a classroom, but we will all still be masked and teachers will be teaching simultaneously with kids at home. I have no say so in the matter. I could be wildly off, but that's just a prediction um, just based on what I'm seeing around the country. Um, I heard that in Florida, there are uh, in the Tampa area, Hillsborough County, they're trying to make masks not required in schools. So I think we just live on different planets sometimes. And I think what we're doing is very safe and it's a good step in the right direction. Um, a parent is asking about uh, pull out instruction for stu students with special needs. That is already in place where it is within the guidance and Ms. Jenkins jump in and clarify if you want. I, this is a parent who I know their child is still at home. So they're probably wondering like what if and when my child goes back, right? We, we currently can um, pull a student out of the classroom. So the teacher, uh, I mean, I've seen it. We have it in some of our upper grades right now. So part of the day, the student is with their, their, um, their peers that are general education, don't have an IEP in their classroom, but then students that have in their IEP uh, pull out minutes where they're, they're re they receive it in a separate classroom of some kind, right? They go to a separate classroom. We've designated each classroom. So it's a classroom that no one else uses during the day. Um, and the teacher takes like three students to that room. And then when they're done teaching those pull out lessons, they take the students back to their original classroom. So with IEPs being individualized, if any families have unique questions about their child's needs, I recommend go to your DL, your child's DL teacher or teachers first. But we've really thought through that with every single child. We've thought through the SICAs, the class assistants that work with the students. It's a constantly moving target because of, of illnesses and whatnot. So the, the SICA that is working with your child may change, may change at any given point. That's always how it's been in schools but we have a good structure for that that's been playing out for the past couple of weeks already. Um, you see, if a student attends on Thursday but has to miss Friday for a pre-scheduled appointment, it looks like that question is still being typed. Um, uh, are they okay to come back the next week? Yeah, we've, so we've seen a few, okay, let, I'm glad something came up that kind of hits on like when to come to school, okay? And you'll hear, you've seen my social media messaging. I've put a couple of things about like, when should your child stay home, right? I know this isn't specifically about illness, but I will hit on that first. We've already seen it a couple times where a child comes to school and maybe the, the parent is feeling under the weather. It's not COVID. They're sure it's not COVID. Like, look, the safest thing is is keep your child home, right? If, if you know that there is any risk that they might be exposed to COVID, 
keep your child home. That is the safest. I'm not saying you have to do that. What is What are your rights? There's a health screener. If your child passes the health screener, they are allowed to come to school. The health screener talks about exposure to COVID. It talks about travel, quarantining for 10 days, all of these things, right? Um, but if you are a, if your child is in a hybrid situation, you have a lot of flexibility. We have a couple of hybrid students who have not been in the building yet, and they'll show up when their family decides to send them. We have some who came today but didn't come yesterday. So if the specific question is, can if they attend on Thursday but has to miss Friday for a pre-scheduled appointment, are they okay to come back the next week? Yeah, they could come Thursday, not come Friday, come the next Thursday and not come the next Friday. All of that is allowable because yeah. it may be for health reasons, it may be for legitimate conflicts. We do highly, highly recommend, and I mean, it goes beyond that, please, please, please have your child learn from home. There's all little things in the Aspen system for attendance. Are they present in person or are they present virtual? And we have to track all of that. We want them engaged one way or the other. It gives us that flexibility, right? Um, someone asked, will leopard days continue with hybrid in place? Perhaps move to Wednesday. Yes, that is exactly what we are planning. Um, yes, we are still planning on having more leopard days. That is uh, the only contingency there is the staff side of it. Um, I think all families would say, you know, I, I try to equate Leopard Day. Don't think of it as lost instruction, right? For anybody thinking like, you know, we need to maximize instruction. Absolutely. We have gone time and time again in our master schedules starting in September beyond the minimum requirements of CPS instructional minutes. You look at a lot of schools, they're figuring out how to fit in the CPS requirements. We are thinking this is the requirements. How do we go beyond that? But I think of it like a field trip. I think of it like um, assemblies, right? That's what we are doing to expose our students to new and engaging learning opportunities. We've gotten great feedback from families. Um, and it's just a matter of like, what our staff planning on doing? So it's not just read alouds all day, every day. Those are fun intermixed with other things. So we're just trying to keep the creativity up amongst the staff uh, and make sure that they don't feel pressure to have to plan something differently because it is more stress in some ways, okay? Yeah, um, thanks, Lisa. I'm with you. I, I love Leopard Day. Uh, it's a great idea. And it's, it's, there's flexibility there. So we're going to continue to develop that. Good. Um, good question. Will we know anything specific about teachers planning on returning in the fall um, for remote learning? Oh, in the fall. Sorry, I misread that. I thought for fourth quarter, <laughs> in case anybody missed it, if they joined us late, we're, we're trying to have that information to you before we go to spring break. Um, at the very least, right when we get back from spring break, it's just unfortunately, we might tell you that a teacher is planning on returning and then that changes later just if their situation changes. Um, but for the fall, I, you know, none of us can predict the future, but I would think that CPS would require all staff to come back in the fall, um, especially because we know that all, I mean, according to President Biden, all staff will, uh, all adults in the country will have had the opportunity to become fully vaccinated before schools would return in like late August, early September. Of course, there might be some rare exceptions across the city for, you know, uh, a child that has medical needs and the staff member cannot come to school, but I, I don't, none of us have any idea, but my assumption would be that CPS would expect all staff to come back in the fall. Um, I'm trying to just scan here, Ms. Jenkins, if uh, I guess, I can look at um, hands that might be raised. I don't see, if anyone wants to raise their hands, know that you can get yeah, questions. I, I don't well. see any. I'm looking for some. I'm also scanning the questions because some of them came through privately to me. Okay, I don't, I don't have any more on the chat. And of course, as we're on this call, like I, I hope our families know, you know that any question you have, you will get a response from me. Uh, it's so nice having children back because if you're a hybrid parent, um, you, you'll see me and Ms. Jenkins every day, right? We're out there at arrival and dismissal every day. Um, at one of the, and the only challenge is now there's what six points of egress that we are using. Yeah. Days, so you never. Good, know good luck time. catching me standing still. <laughs> but I do try to. I, I myself at least try to hover around the first and second grade entrance, just because that's when most of our kids come, um, and then pop over to kindergarten at some point. Um, and I try to be in six places at once. Um, but I do think that the older students, um, their, their flow into the building is, is so quick. They're in and out very quickly, our fifth and up. Um, so the, the best place would be uh, first grade, I think, where, where entry is a little bit um, slower just because they're little. 
Um, I see a couple of private questions that came through. Um, if, if a family situation is they chose hybrid for quarter three, but then changed their mind to stay remote, do they still need to fail out the daily, fill out the daily health screener? Um, no, if that's, that's an interesting point. If you are currently remote, um, or you are not coming in for the day, you do not need to fill out the health screener that you're probably getting a text message for. What happens is for those of you that are staying home, you wouldn't know, right? Like when children, I mean, it's literally this simple. Ms. Jenkins showed you in pictures. When students walk up to the door, we look for them on a list. And if there's, uh, if it says pass on the check-in system or green in Aspen, we let them into the building. We do a forehead check and we let them in. So if your child is at home, we're not even looking for them. So you don't need to take that. I, I hear it only takes less than 30 seconds, but you don't need to. Um, one other family says, I'm guessing we can again check mark hybrid for fourth quarter, but still back out. Yes, my recommendation to any family is if you know you're going to stay remote, please just say remote. If you know that you're unsure or you're sure that you're going to come back, say hybrid. Give yourself that flexibility between now and fourth quarter and we'll plan accordingly. If you remember back in December, we had 65% of our families at first say hybrid. So we plan for that. And then when it dropped below 50% or so, and depends on each grade level, it become it became exponentially easier for us to plan for hybrid reopening. The difference is none of our staff, myself included, were vaccinated then. Um, I can't speak to whether everybody is vaccinated right now, but what I can say is that CPS has a good plan in place to have everybody vaccinated by the beginning of fourth quarter. And I don't see any issues with that from what I'm seeing go on in schools like ours and others. So I do think that every staff member would have had that opportunity in, in all schools. This is not me commenting on confidential matters, but um, like I said, everyone has their own uh, unique situation, right? Um, uh, has there been any messaging to the neighborhood that school is back in session? Our child told us that there were non-school people on the playground when our kids, yes. So. It's hard. Um, the messaging at schools has typically been you're supposed to, and what I've been messaging as well is you're supposed to disperse after school. Um, if you're planning play dates with others, go meet up elsewhere. The challenge is uh, we have messaged. Uh, Alderman Smith has messaged to the community. I've messaged to the OTT, the Old Town Triangle Association. We, we littered cars with flyers, but it, we don't have staffing in place to um, enforce rules on the playground here after school. We do have a vendor that uses part of the turf on certain days. So that is, I, I just, I, I don't, you know, if families wanna recommend anything, you can talk to me about it, maybe email me or, or chat with me when you see me outside, but the challenge Excuse is- Excuse me, Mr. Graves, yeah. this is actually during school. Oh. Where there's neighborhood people on the playground during recess. And to me, that seems somewhat of a safety issue if you yeah. have randoms. Yeah. On no, the playground with your child, with your children. That's definitely not okay. Sorry, I must have misread that. Said during recess. Yeah, no, that um, is a few times I've seen that happen. We've had our security guard address those groups, and they've left. Um, so if that's continuing, we will address that. I, I assumed it meant after school as well. Um, if it's been like so, if it's been like the end of the day and teachers are taking kids out just for an additional little break, um, then we have we've let. If it's close to four o'clock, we've let groups stay, but during our scheduled recess time, we do ask everyone to leave the uh, area when we bring kids out, if people are still out there. Yeah. So, if that, you know, and if it's been an issue where that's not happening, we will definitely um, revisit that with staff to let them yeah. know to have security address them. Closing the fences, things like that, we can definitely make sure that's being addressed. Um, and, and I think the only challenge is like, K-1-2, those grades go out for like a second recess. And if it's right at the end of the day, yeah, there might be um, families that have already shown up. You know, if you've got an upper grades child, your child gets out at 350. So if you show up at 345 um, and you let your little one, your preschooler, you know, like there's some situations at, at, by about 340 or so on. But before that, we should, we're going to, yeah, we'll tighten up on that and make sure the fences are closed. That's, I, I think Ms. Jenkins and I need to see that for ourselves. Yeah, um, someone was asking about with seventh and eighth grade teachers um, being remote, um, how was attendance from Monday to Tuesday? I, I think it was consistent. Monday's attendance was consistent with Tuesday's attendance, but also wondering um, how's it going without the core teachers being there. Uh, but 
we have one of our cadre members who actually was the teacher for the first part of the year um, with upper grade, Mr. Cheatham is one of our upper grade teachers um, that's in the building and he's in the room with students. And then we also have a new staff member, but it's a, consistently the same staff member in the room with students and then we're visiting frequently. So I think it's going um, well with, and so far when I've asked the students how it's going, they would agree that it's going well, but um, we're definitely gonna keep an eye on, on on those rooms to make sure, but I feel very uh, happy and trustworthy uh, that, that uh, I trust that things are going well in those upper grades because the teachers are there, they're just there remotely. And the person um, that we have in place, I think uh, we have strong people in place to make sure that it goes well. Yeah, and it's not ideal, right? It's not, if none of this is ideal, none of this is how we want it. But um, I, you know, as I mentioned on the recording that we sent out with the seventh and eighth grade teachers, the major downside is the teachers you know, certain teachers are not in person. The, there are some bright spots, right? We're able to combine two pods into one. So we have all the eighth graders in one room, all of the seventh graders in one room. So uh, on the Monday, Tuesday, or the Thursday, Friday pod. So at least they get to be with their friends. I think attendance wise, we might've lost one student each day just because something individual to that child was not a good fit. But I'm optimistic that the numbers will go up in fourth quarter and, you know, certain staff will see across the city who's coming back. Um, I think it'll be a better experience. It's just, it's hard when a lot of families opted out early enough that then your child is asking. What we noticed is like, yeah, I could imagine if this student doesn't want to be here because none of their friends are here and the other students in the classroom are students they know, but they don't hang out with, right? So in the upper grades, that's kind of a big deal. I noticed in like K-1-2, that's not an issue at all. They're, they're all friends with each other, hanging out with each other. So um, if hybrid, someone just asked, if hybrid numbers are extremely low, can kids move from two to four days in person? There are some situations, and, we, and I think I mentioned earlier, we actually, we're piloting that in a couple of classrooms right now, a four day pod, um, but it just depends on the situation. So I, I'd recommend like reach out to your child's teacher and ask if that's a possibility and they'll tell you why or why not. Um, and, and like I said, fourth quarter, it's probably less likely because we're gonna have more kids opting in. So if that number in that classroom crosses uh, 14, 15, 16, it's just less likely that we're able to stretch that across two days. But it is still a possibility. Like we, we saw how it played out with the one classroom that started four days and then the second one that's going four days now, how it's a little more nuanced than that. So do reach out to your child's teacher and ask about the possibility and they'll share with you what they can. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any questions, I see we're kind of slowing down on what's being put into the box. We'll send out this recording. You know we're around. You know that, I mean, Ms. Jenkins and I were just talking. We're probably going to do at least one more of these before fourth quarter. We just, we don't know what else is going to come out from CPS. You know, everything. Yeah, is like a pre-fourth quarter. <laughs> we'll do that in there. Okay. Go ahead. Sometimes, sometimes we only get a... Uh, like a one hour heads up over you on some information. So, um, you know, we'll try to answer what we can. Um, good, and you know, and hey, the Thank positive you. feedback is appreciated. We, we need to know, like, honestly, like critical feedback is helpful. Honestly, positive feedback is as well. And I, and I don't mean that because we're looking for compliments here. Like we see the joy on kids' faces, but if something is working and you let us know that is working, that is very helpful for us to know so we can keep that in place and build on it. Um, you know, versus us thinking something is working, but we don't know, right? So your feedback in any form is what we want. Um, we'll keep sending out these FAQs because you can put a question in there. You can also put feedback in there, right? So, um, yeah, thank you. I see a few more comments coming through, but you know, a lot of you have individual situations, so you know we're gonna be able, I have LSC in less than 48 hours, so I'm gearing up for that, but you know you'll get a response from me in the next few days if you, uh, if you need something further. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Like like Mr. Graves said, um, we'll we'll do a pre fourth quarter uh, town hall with you for you know questions that will arise between now and then. Um, I'm sure as we get closer to it, we'll, we'll we'll give you more details about what's coming up. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Um. Let I think last thing I'll say to end on a more positive note too. One thing we are really trying to work on as a staff is 
how to develop a sense of community between our students in person and our students at home. We, we don't want either group to feel left out, you know, the students that are in person, but there are only a few of their friends here, or students more notably, of course, um, the students that are at home that, uh, you know, are feeling like their, their friends at school are getting this amazing experience. So we, we're trying to think of like how we can uh, do more activities with kids. We're actually meeting as a staff tomorrow to talk about that and really put our heads together. And those of you that, that have your own ideas, you know, we're going to create a collaborative Google Docs amongst the staff and things like that. So anything you want to share, if, if we feel like that's something that we can do and it'll be value added, we'll add it to our collection of thoughts. So we're open to your, your input because we want your kids happy and safe and learning, of course. So thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great night. It was good talking to you. And I think if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead um, and end this call. Take care, everyone. Thanks.